work session, eWeb work session, September 21st, 2021. Welcome everybody. I'm just going to apologize in advance and I'm a little fried. I just got off of a two and a half hour Zoom meeting and um, not a lot of recovery time. So <laughs> um, just forgive me if I'm a little spacey and just remind me if I'm forgetting anything. <laughs> um, but we're going to jump right into agenda check. Does anybody have any Thing they want to say about the agenda. Great. Then we will jump right into the Lieberg Project Tour follow-up and Q&A. So uh, President Schlossberg, um, commissioners, good evening. Um, Frank Lawson, uh, I'm just going to have Mark Zinnaker do a quick two-minute recap of our tour uh, that occurred last Friday. And then uh, the intent of this agenda item was to field any additional thoughts or questions that commissioners may have either to answer now or later. So Mark, I will just turn it directly to you. Great, yeah, thank you, Frank. And um, I'm sure glad you were able to join us. And I, I do hope that that tour gave you some tangible feeling for the complexities that we're dealing with up there at Lieberg. It was a pleasure to talk to you about it. Um, some recaps. Uh, we saw and talked about uh, a number of environmental impacts associated with the project in terms of fish passage. Um, we also noted that you know fish passage facilities at Lieberg are actually operating pretty well, and uh, there's also an opportunity for the fish agencies to get a unique opportunity to monitor upstream and downstream fish passage. Um, talked also about how Lieberg Dam might in the future facilitate uh, permit permanent native hatchery fish sorting facility, though that could be done whether the project's in service or not at that location. Um, at the same time, we did note uh, that environmental and regulatory constraints would likely increase over time in the face of climate change, uh, especially if temperature and endangered species conditions worsen. Um, on the social side, we talked a lot about the uh, potential impacts from loss of the lake or the canal, how that would impact recreation, uh, property owners, commercial irrigators, uh, both the Lieberg and the McKenzie Hatchery, um, while acknowledging that there were also viable solutions out there, whether it's uh, alternative access routes across the river, uh, transfer of surface water rights to groundwater, uh, construction of pump station for the hatcheries, and how uh, recreation can continue as well in a stormwater conveyance condition is just be different. Um, on the economic side, we talked about the various dam safety issues that are driving the need to invest in the canal. Uh, you saw the close proximity of development to the canal and the potential for consequences. Um, there's the internal erosion vulnerabilities, seismic vulnerabilities, potential for high flows and debris getting into the canal during severe storms potential for landslides. So to continue power generation, each of those potential failure modes would need to be mitigated in a prioritized fashion over time until essentially the entire canal meets modern design standards. So uh, taking the canal out of service in October 2018 did immediately accomplish a lot of risk reduction, uh, but eWeb does still need uh, to safely convey all those tributary creeks back to the river during large storms, and that would will require significant investment. Um, we don't necessarily need to design that stormwater conveyance for worst case seismic scenario, so, and we don't necessarily need to do the entirety of the canal, um, but we would likely be designing for very large storm events. Um, finally, we talked a lot about uncertainties, how uh, crystal clear answers may not be possible for many of the questions because of the complex nature of our situation, uh, but we will strive to provide the board with information about both sides of the story and include sensitivity analyses in our financial modeling, et cetera, so that the board is informed from a range of perspectives when providing direction. So that's my quick summary, and I think we wanted to open it up for any follow-ups that uh, came to mind since the tour. Great, go ahead, Sonia. Well, thank you very much for that recap, and thank you so much for the tour. It was really fantastic to be out there and, and see everything firsthand. It just makes it so much more real when you can you know, talk about it and see the issues firsthand. 
Um, you know, one thing that came out for me personally, and I'm I'm curious what others have to say, but you know, when we think about operating Lieberg as an electric generating facility, it seems, you know, you talk about the crystal ball, you're not going to have that crystal ball, but what we do know is that climate change is, is making the variance more and more, you know, significant, lower water flows, and maybe higher water flows, both of which are not great operating conditions. We do know that we will not have, you know, regulatory certainty in moving forward. And, you know, from, from my perspective, it, it and, and the fact that, you know, Lieberg just doesn't have a very large capability to generate, um, it, it seems less and less viable to me um, to keep that as a generating facility. Now, how we handle the canal and the storm water and, and you know, the other community uh, impacts, environmental impacts for the canal and, and the people that it either threatens or supports, you know, that that is a much broader issue. But I, I do wonder if, you know, others had a, kind of a similar uh, thinking. I know some of the other earlier impacts that we've seen or the estimates that we've seen said it would be operating in a negative anyway. So those are some of the things that I think about. And I know you have a lot of, there's so many different factors. I, I would hope that maybe as a board, if others agree that we might be able to narrow that focus for you so that's not an item that we're continuing to have you spin your wheels on so that that's my quick takeaway great thank you for that feedback go ahead john borofsky thank you um i had a question uh and then i'll, I'll kind of speak to what sonia was was talking about um so I was up there, I came back from Bend on Monday, and you mentioned one of the people that had water rights was the lavender farm. Um, but to me, I, the lavender farm seemed more towards Walter. I mean, it, it was well past Lieberg. Is there a separate lavender There's farm? A, there is a separate one. It's called Blackberry Hill Nursery, I believe. So. Okay. But I All know right. which one you're talking about. You're correct. Closer yeah. to Deer Horn, there's another. Yeah, that, that you know, that's what I was like. Okay, the lavender farm. Then I looked, and it was like, no, that's that couldn't be it because it was well outside the boundaries. Um, so, so yeah, I you know, I I agree to a certain extent as to what you're saying, but for me, I I still need to have more of the data out there because. When, I, when we got the the presentation at the board meeting before this, that we got the the opinion from the lawyers and, and what it would involve to do, you know, amend the license and all those things, I was like, oh gosh, you know, it's gonna be return to services the way I'm gonna fall down. And then after doing this tour, it's like, oh, stormwater conveyance is the way that I think I'm gonna come down. So at this point, I there is definitely more information that I will need to be, to be able to say yet one way or another, because you can get data that will support either one of those, and it's all just how you how you present it. And until we do a, a at least a a perfunctory triple bottom line on it, I I wouldn't be ready to to give direction one way or another. Uh, so that's where I'm at. Go ahead, John Brown. So yeah, I agree with everybody uh, what you've said, but also uh, I want to compliment again uh, the effectiveness of that tour uh, was one of the best I've had in decades of uh, being here. So that aside, uh, some of the things I'd like to see when we go down uh, down the rabbit hole, so to speak, is that uh, if we go from threatened to endangered on Chinook, um, is that for a 12 month period or is that for the, the the transitory period down like downstream migration upstream migration or i mean how how could that affect our operations because that's going to be big on mine because i think we're probably heading that way and if we spend 50 to 70 million dollars to return to service and then find out we can only you know are we are we shut down 60 days out of the year or 120 or 365 because I, that's going to affect me you don't have to answer it now those are just things i'm i'm concerned about and the other thing is about um uh you know there's some things there that you know FERC, like i go back to say they issued this license and, it, and it's not about the seepage 
you know, in the canal. That's that's on us. But the fact that now that, you know, when we look down at that home that we just bought and we're going to move it because of the fact that that, you know, 80, 80 foot uh, canal wall could cave in because of seismic, that, that condition was there when they issued the license and that seismic concern was there. And now all of a sudden it's changing. And so if, if this is the norm nationwide, I mean, about prioritize priorities and you know we're gonna have to do this up at Carmen with uh, Trail Bridge and you know I think a lookout and I think of all these other facilities that are much more vulnerable than this one but uh, it I, I'll have that question we're gonna have to tear that entire canal wall down and take those loose rocks out of there and put concrete in because nothing's going to change that hazard um, on those walls failing with with uh, seismic and I you know uh, I, I don't know where that's going to go but we got a lot of a lot of you know, I call it squeezing the balloon when we ask one question, then three more pop up. Um, and so uh, those are things I'm going to look at is uh, kind of getting into it about what if, what if, what if, because um, we're, you're talking about economic projections and having been through um, several of them with Carmen, with uh, um, Seneca, and when we had forward price projections on making things justifiably economically, um, what a pretty big disparity of what, uh, what we initially thought about like Seneca, what we initially thought about Carmen. And I, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit skeptical on these future Ford price curves because I don't have a good track record of saying that, okay, what was projected and what was reality uh, have come about. So those are, those are areas I'm going to push back on a little bit or hope, hope that we can, um, you could convince me and sell it to me. So I don't need answers now, just so you know where I'm going to come from. Thank you. Good. Good. Thank you. Matt, did you go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Mindy. Um, like the rest of the commissioners, I just want to say thanks for the tour. I felt like that was a really great use of our time. It was a lengthy tour, but um, there's no substitute for being out there and seeing the stuff on the ground and you all really explained that um, what we were looking at early and um, I appreciate that Lisa, Mark, Frank, the full team. Thanks for making that happen. Um, my comments are going to be pretty brief. Uh, three things that would help me uh, in making a decision here would be um, our best guess or estimate, not a guess, estimate of the full cost of electricity generated. Um, I know it's going to be hard to get like the all included cost, but we could at least say we know it's more than uh, whatever a floor, you know, I, I guess I can't say with confidence we can say that. But, um, you know, to the extent that we have kind of a range of what we think the full included cost of generated electricity over the course of a year from the Lieber, Lieber facility would be, that would be helpful. Um, uh, TVL, we talked about that in the, and um, Commissioner Barofsky brought that up as well. To me, um, at least a preliminary TBL. It doesn't have to be ranked, in my view. Uh, it's there's so many apples and oranges that uh, I don't expect anybody to say how much something's worth compared to anything else. I'm just looking for a kind of complete revealing of the full suite of impacts across environment, economy, and social impacts. And the third thing would be um, some additional community conversations with the neighbors near Leeburg. Um, uh, we certainly got a sense of that in the meeting that we had up river. I think that was in April, um, but some additional more focused conversations with folks, um, perhaps as a part of a tour or perhaps just after they complete a tour, um, uh, you know, some some really tangible conversations with folks up there to get an understanding of where they're coming from, what solutions might work for them or won't, um, you know, how you can be most supportive. Um, that would be really helpful for me. Um, so those are the three things. And then if we have them, uh, you know, our best estimate of the commissioning versus recommissioning. And we talked about a, a further seismic evaluation of the canal. I know that may take time, so that may not be able to happen quickly. But if that were available, that would be helpful. Those are my comments. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um. I feel really similarly to Sonia. Um, I, I agree with her. Like the my my first pass is the economics seem to be pretty clear. 
Um, so I know what our timeline is and um, kind of piggybacking on what Matt said about having the getting a little bit more um, input from the community. I know that this isn't like a all community decision kind of thing, but I do think of um, kind of outreach to the community is super, super important. And I don't know like if somebody has like laid out a whole timeline, but I'm wondering if we could have some kind of community tour, not open to the whole community, but just some stakeholders and have that before our upriver meeting that's in April, I think. I don't know if that's too aggressive of a timeline, but that might be a natural time. Like we're gonna be up there meeting with folks to um, kind of uh, have them have had some, some kind of outreach to them. Um, so I, I guess what would be helpful to me would be maybe maybe to see like a more complete timeline of what what it how do you envision us spending the next whatever it is 14 months um and if we really need 14 months because before i was thinking like wow this is super rushed but after that tour i thought maybe it's not so rushed so that would kind of help me figure out a little bit more what the process is um i also want to echo everybody's thanks for that. I thought that was so incredibly helpful um, on many levels, but just being out there and being able to see it and talking with each other in a more natural way and being able to ask uh, questions of each other. I just think that if there's other opportunities or things like this come up specifically around this project that it just seems to save us a lot of time to be able to do a field trip like this. I know it's it's pretty work intensive for all of you who arranged it and took took your day for that. So I appreciate that, but I think it's definitely time well spent. Yes, Frank. Uh, yes, President Schlossberg, Commissioners. So first of all, um, we wanted to thank you for your time on Friday. It's actually rare that we can get all five of you in the same place at the same time, um, but I think it really showed um, how the conversation can be facilitated that way, especially when you're talking about a complex issue. Um, I think we really view this process as an iterative educational process um, of commissioners and of the community. I think both of those are incredibly important in this process. And we, uh, before the end of the year, will uh, uh, provide uh, you and the community with a communications and outreach plan um, for uh, the Lieberg area and the neighbors and those those impacted, so the stakeholders. Um, I also think there's just a number of iterative questions that'll be answered along the way. Uh, you know, the, the value of power is something that I, I think uh, is of obvious importance, um, especially in the context of the work that we do with other resources. So it's it's really looking at either the necessity and or the cost of replacing the attributes that are provided by Lieberg. So um, the carbon free attributes, for example, the the time of which it can produce and not produce. So it's it's when you're looking at that in the context of our total um, generation mix, that's where we can provide some insight into what we think the value is and how that it kind of extrapolates out for the remainder of the license. Um, and so just a number of things. Um, I, I think that, um, um, like like I said, this is going to be um, an iterative process. This is one of many steps. Um, I think it was a great step, um, but there's a lot more to come, and um, it'll it'll be kind of be you know you'll feel like you're getting a refresher probably on a regular basis uh, from the staff. And I thought I thought uh, Mark and Lisa and Karen and others did a really great job of providing. Um, a lot of information and just answering the barrage of questions that you you pose their direction. So thank you for your participation. Yeah, Sonia. Sorry, I had a quick question for staff. I, I just pulled up the backgrounder that we got on Labor Dam back in in January, where it had the NPV analysis, you know, high, medium, low assumptions and medium and low, we lose $5 million and $8 million. High, we we have three million that we gain. I'm curious if any of the other information that you've, you know, gleaned over the last nine months has, you know, if you expect that that will change that economic analysis very much. 
We I, we do because one thing about that NPV that was done previously is it did look at a shorter time frame that did not include the uh, relicensing and decommissioning considerations. So this next cut that we'll be taking at the net present value does go beyond that 20 year remaining life of the license and and does take into account those end of license costs, whether it be decommissioning or um, relicensing. So it will look uh, different for certain. So, so there's a lot more costs that are going to get lumped in to this next analysis. That doesn't sound like it's going to make it any better. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It okay. might make it okay. more stark. I, that's true. OK, all right. I just wanted to be clear. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions about this? Great. Well, thank you for um, giving us that recap, Mark and Lisa, for you being here, too, and um, allowing us to ask some follow up questions and uh, share our thoughts. Yeah, really good input and comments. We appreciate it. Thank you. Great. OK, so we will move on to the main part of this work session, which is the strategic revision update. Final discussion. With you, Frank. Oh, President Schlossberg, commissioners, uh, good evening. Uh, this is Frank Lawson again, um, eWeb general manager. Um, so go ahead with the next slide, please, Holly. So. Um, one of our goals this year is to work uh, with uh, all of you to kind of evaluate and uh, provide potential revisions for the strategic plan. Um, we did uh, provide a background um, memo as part of this meeting. It included a number of different observations and uh, about the present plan, uh, some questions for you to ponder and consider, and also um, attached to that was a uh, proposed revision um, to the strategic plan. Um, it wasn't a long read. I think it was two pages in total, so hopefully you got a chance to scour that and um, absorb some of the content in there. Go ahead with the next slide. Um, so uh, a number of the observations that came out of the, uh, the plan um, and the planning process, um, some of you were involved in the original plan and revision. Some of you have come along more recently. Uh, there's uh, a few just noteworthy observations. Most of the key um, strategic priorities still exist uh, around resource decisions, emergency preparedness. Uh, we do know that the operating environment that we're in is, is becoming more turbulent. Um, technology, right, as we, we've just discussed in the last topic, the regulatory environment, um, customer preference, uh, a lot of those are continuing to change, which poses some some challenge in both operations and planning. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we captured any sort of uniqueness uh, between the water utilities situation and the electric utilities situation. We think we've done that. Um, and we wanted to expand a little bit around when we talk about resiliency, we wanted to make sure we weren't just talking about infrastructure that we were talking about financial resiliency and workforce resiliency, and so we wanted to incorporate that into the next revision. Um, there was also a piece that was missing, which was around modernizing our IT and IS assets. Uh, we've tried to incorporate that, including into some of the, the phases of, of which we're evolving and the path we're taking strategically. Um, and then we recognized that the values that are listed in the strategic plan um, are really a roster of sort of equally weighted values and we recognize there's some tension between those and that different commissioners uh, being reflective of the community will interpret those and weigh those differently when there's uh, when there's that tension and so we wanted to offer up either a prioritization of those um, if commissioners want to go there or if they're still comfortable with the fact that some of those tensions can exist and that we need to wrestle through those on a uh, opportunity by opportunity basis. Uh, and then finally, just a, a, a note about governance. I think one of the things that comes out of, of this particular type of, of planning and operating environment is that governance can change and it can change on a two year cycle. Uh, and depending on the turnover of the board, um, it drives us to make sure that we do things within those windows that are measurable as well. So we have some milestones that are developed. Go ahead, uh, Holly, with the next slide, please. 
Um, so uh, where did the strategy actually end up? So there's there's a few things that I just want to note. Uh, one of them is that um, strategy is a privilege. <laughs> you know, if you're not operating well day to day, uh, then you don't really deserve the right to pursue the longer term positioning. Uh, so we do recognize that even though a lot of times uh, operational excellence isn't really considered strategic, um, it can be a barrier. And so we want to make sure that we recognize that. Um, the conditions we think we've captured, um, we are forecasting. One of the things that, that you'll note is that we talk often about the volatility and the scarcity of our supplies and sources of supply. Um, that is, is both um, prevalent on the, the water side as well as the um, electric side. How we would determine success, and this is really, you know, if, if you want to capture the essence of uh, the the strategic plan. This is this is really uh, this quote here is directly out of the plan, which is really how effective we we can synchronize our customer consumption uh, with the futures increasing volatility and scarcity of our supply. Um, how well we do that will determine how safely, reliably, affordably, and environmentally responsibly and equitably we deliver our services as you know even during disruptive events. And so that's. That's really the essence of it. And you can call it synchronizing, you can call it balancing, aligning, how we how well we align the consumption with that volatility and that scarcity from time to time will determine our success. And then the path we're going to use to get there uh, will be uh, by developing uh, resiliency and flexibility within our different uh, operating aspects, financial people, processes, and it'll eventually rely on customer participation uh, in products and services that help mitigate some of our challenges, including those that occur during disruptive events, and um, it'll also guide many of our investments. And so that's kind of the, the essence of trying to capture the, the strategic plan. Next slide, please. So um, how we're going to get there, the path we really kind of developed um, three different stepping stones, um, you know, the uh, called it the, in, a, in a chess analogy, the opening, uh, the middle game, uh, and then the end game. I'll, I'll concentrate really mostly on the, on the middle game. And, and part of the reason there is, is that's really where the next few years take us. Um, and what are the important, important aspects of the next few years? Um, it's really to build the foundational pieces that ultimately come together for that synchronizing and alignment of supply and demand. Um, many of those pieces are listed here. I'm not going to go through those. I'll go through those a little bit later. Um, but those are there's some uniqueness between water and electric on the resiliency front. Um, but those, if you were to say, what are some of the most or the most strategic things that we're doing over the next few years? That's what would occur in the middle game. Those are the building blocks. Next, next slide, please. So um, there were a few opportunities. Just want to address those directly that we identified uh, distinct water and electric conditions. So the scarcity piece is and these are these are quotes out of the, the newly proposed and revised plan. Um, the scarcity and volatility, the climate impacts, um, the increasing occurrence of threats, um, those occur on both sides, water and electric uh, across the organization. Um, water really the key decisions have to do with uh, sources, um, the uh, potential for a second drinking water treatment plant on the Willamette and simultaneously making sure that we're recovering and protecting our existing watershed on the Mackenzie. Um, it doesn't mean that other things are important. We've talked about the importance of of and how strategic water storage is, for example, and those are part of the resiliency work, um, but we have tried to capture at least the the priorities within the, the the two utilities, and then the electric side. It's to reassemble um, a power supply portfolio that really looks at the the best combination of economic, environmental, social benefit for our community, um, and at the same time recognizing you know what this ballooning comment means is basically the infrastructure that was put in in the electric division. Uh, was was installed throughout the community very heavily in the 60s and 70s, and all of that is aging at the same time. So we have this ballooning, uh, you know, aging uh, simultaneously, uh, which means that uh, the 
the replacement of that is also going to affect your financial and your resources to replace it effectively. Next slide. So the other uh, piece of the, the challenge or the opportunity we saw to, to make the plan just that much better was to identify specific upcoming milestones. Um, I touched on that a little bit earlier, so I won't elaborate here. So there, there's some in the electric side and some in the water side. Um, the electric side, the, the metering, the integrated resource plan, which um, is incredibly important even for the discussion we just had, um, although it won't uh, actually answer the decision directly about Lieberg, it'll it'll start to place value um, on some of the attributes um, that we're talking about. Um, the uh, rate design and pricing, well, that again is not this year over the next few years. If we ultimately want to have people participate in new kinds of demand response time of use, then we will have to make sure that that we have a little better alignment between our costs and our prices. And I think there's there's a lot more work to come that almost as much work as the Lieber Canal, um, but this this will be more fun uh, than dealing with some of those issues, I think, um, depending on um, if you if you get a enjoy rate design. Um, and then ultimately we start to launch some new products that customers can participate in and not just new products um, on the consumption side, but also uh, potentially new products on the conservation and energy efficiency side. So those those actually go hand in hand. And then you see the reservoirs and interconnecting transmission. The drinking water master plan is is due to be um, um, updated and revised and approved um, um, in by 20 on or before 2025. And then, as I mentioned earlier, a second drinking water treatment plant um, to mitigate uh, the fact that we have a single primary source of drinking water. Next slide. So uh, the final, you know, another one of the opportunities was to to look at right now we have a roster of values. Uh, those um, are not ranked necessarily. They all contain their own elements. We've made a few changes to those. We added um, equity into the strategic plan in a number of locations, including here. Uh, we also uh, uh, split out, uh, which was a recommendation for quite some time, um, affordable and environmental. That used to just be sort of lumped under responsible. Uh, we think that both of those kind of warrant their their own um, attention without getting uh, an ex extreme long list of, of values. Um, and then we we expanded a little bit on the safe side to in, in, include the security and integrity of cyber assets and data and other other types of assets. So these have evolved a little bit, um, but they they are still a, a roster and and they are not prioritized in any particular order. We we do tend to place safety um, uh, when it comes to the practical application. We tend to uh, to place safety at the forefront. Um, but all of them are important, and I, I don't think that I could really legitimately say that um, any of these are necessarily more important than others. I'll go ahead with the next slide. I think the uh, in the background memo we posed a, a few different questions for the board to think about. Um, these were really designed to to make sure that um, you know sometimes you can read a read a plan and I know that you've been in, involved with the plan for quite some time some of you and, and seen it evolve and sometimes it's not just what's in the plan it's what's not in the plan that you have to kind of tease out uh, some of these were designed to do that uh, for example the, the the question around are are we defining ourselves too narrowly or too widely you know, you can, uh, are there predisposed disposition that the board has, for example, about the McKinsey Valley Electric Territory? Um, that's one that it's not specifically listed in our mission. Um, it's not specifically excluded. Um, and if the board wanted to specifically include it or exclude it, um, then, um, you know, this is, this is an opportunity to do that. Um, the same with, with growth um, or expansion. Um, when we look at generation assets, um, you know, the third question there, um, you know, is is the board predisposed to own generation um, or not own generation? You know, and this is outside of the context of the integrated resource plan, which tells us, which will tell us the characteristics of the resources we want. You know, some might look at this and go, well, being in the generation business is very expensive. 
Um, and we're the size of a utility where, as, as, you, as you have noticed, um, a significant amount of effort, cost, and resource goes into uh, your generation assets. Uh, those can actually be purchased or acquired or, um, uh, you know, power can be um, attained in a number of different ways. You don't necessarily have to own generation. Um, now, the other, if by leaving it vague, it, the uh, potential for the integrated resource plan to help guide us is is there. If the board said, no, we we absolutely want to be in the business because we we really think it gives us a presence on the McKenzie or for whatever reason, then that's that would be good to know. Um, you know, the other thing um, about you know, and, and these these questions were in in your background or so I don't know that I'll I'll actually uh, read these further, but um, hopefully we'll get a chance and the board will take these into consideration during your discussion and, and deliberation of the new plan. Go ahead with the next slide, please. So uh, the goal of this work session is to to foster discussion, alignment, you know, understanding um, of the uh, newly proposed and revised uh, strategic plan. It was attached. I think there's actually a reference slide where it's all of the words are actually presented on about four slides. Um, there's other some other reference slides that are in the back here. Uh, but at this point, I wanted to uh, find out and, and solicit feedback, comments, direction uh, from the board relative to what was presented to you um, in the backgrounder, which included a new strategic plan, and find out if there were any comments uh, with the goal that potentially we could approve it um, at our next regular board meeting. So that's um, that's my opening remarks. And with that, uh, uh, President Schlossberg, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Great. Um, well, I'm not sure if there's anybody who wants to go ahead and jump in. Sonia, I'm not sure if your hand is poised to be raised. Go ahead. I mean, I, I can go unless others want to. I don't have to <laughs> first, but I don't see anybody else fighting for it, so I guess I'll go. Uh, OK, so on the, the question of kind of the prioritization of the different values, um, I mean, I I typically sort of see safety as one that's kind of not as negotiable as some of the others. I can think of a lot of other situations where you know, affordability and maybe reliability or environment and local, those all have more of an interplay. And I can think of a different situation where I would put each one of those kind of above one another. Um, safety, not as much, but I, I don't know that it really, I don't know that it really needs to be prioritized for me. I mean, I think that, you know, as a group and even within the organization, I think we can see where there are times when you know each of those are, are needed dependent on the situation. Um, I, as far as some of the strategic um, priorities of opportunities, I am, I at some point would like more information about kind of the the Springfield um, opportunity around the water plant. Are are we? Bring that aside, is that still a consideration um, it, that we are working with Springfield? Uh, you know, I, I've gotten some information that they think that we're stalling and we're not working with them to just utilize the water plant that they have. I don't I don't know what you know where we're at with that, but I. I still think it's very important that we have a secondary water source and that it's on the Willamette. So I guess, you know, in terms of how the strategic plan works, um, that still needs to be a conversation. Um, and the other, as for some of the other questions in there, I do still, you know, personally wonder if, you know, at some point it would be helpful for us to expand to uh, looking at internet, broadband like we've done with the interchange and how we expand that more broadly for the benefit of Eugene. Uh, we are strategically poised to do that. Now, that said, we have so many large projects right now that I would not put that above others, but you ask, so I'm throwing it out there as I still would like that to be on the back burner, but 
you know, dealing with Walterville secondary water source, getting our, um, you know, our our storage tanks in, all of those large projects uh, certainly take priority for me. And you know, staff, this is one of those where the interplay of uh, affordability and time that staff have available, and you know, those all come into play. Those take pri priority for me. Um, as for some of the others, I mean, I, I think our, our focus and where the community is at, I think that, you know, I'm I'm good with where we're currently at. I don't think that we need to expand necessarily. If there was an opportunity to focus more on maybe the regions where people can actually vote for the groups that they're being represented by and or there, there's a partnership that made sense to take you know some of the other territory away like the mckenzie valley i mean it, it may be something that that i would be open to but i think the community i don't know that the community would really be supportive necessarily that would be a much bigger conversation and i don't know that it needs to be part of our strategic focus necessarily um i do like having um to the question number five I definitely like splitting out the climate change, the environmental aspect, and I do agree with the board policy and SD15. I think that's a really critical piece that we still need to highlight and keep separate. It's it's if we don't work on this as a civilization, we're toast. Um, so we need to play our part and it has to be at the forefront. And that's that's what I have. Thanks for the opportunity to weigh in. Yeah, Commissioner Carlson, uh, uh, I think John Brown wants to be up. I would just comment a couple of on a couple of things. So um, the this this strategic piece of the secondary water plant is the recognition and the willingness to make that investment. Um, a relationship with Springfield Utility Board or somebody else or looking for um, grant money, alternative uh, types of financing. Those to me are part of the financial analysis and tactical implementation. Um, I will make the comment that uh, Springfield Utility Board's plant on the McKenzie is just totally inadequate for our needs. Um, we are still continuing to have discussions. We recently signed a, an, um, a purchase and sale agreement on some property in Glenwood that gives um, us uh, a little bit more flexibility to work with Springfield or others. Um, there's a little bit of a difference of the drivers there between what a Springfield Utility Board and what EWEB would like to achieve out of another project, but we are still in, in discussions. But I, I do see that as a, um, a tactical piece of that, as, as well as you know, when we talk about that in October, we'll talk a little bit about the financing and how much um, the rate impact of getting others to participate or grant grant participation. So that's that's a tactical implementation. If if we were to expand into um, broadband, for example, if the board wanted to be more active with that, I would probably uh, want to take that outside of the normal eWeb operation and, and staff, um, either through some kind of consulting or skunk works type of assessment. Um, it it we we do have just a plethora of things to do in the next five years. And not that there's no potential in that. We are well well suited for it probably, but I would probably want to do it outside of the normal competition for resources. And the board would have to be willing to to look at some separate um, financing for that out, you know, just set aside a certain degree of investment in that if that was the case. Um, so. Thank you for your feedback. Um, President Schlossberg, I think I saw John Brown's hand up go go up briefly and then he pulled it back down. So I don't know if he really wants to say anything. Go for it, I'll jump in if it's okay. Um, I, I'll go backwards on the questions because they're the the like five and six are easy. Um, six about uh, the values that it, in balanced order of uh, safe, reliable, affordable, environmental and community still work. It works for me. 
So I'm okay with that. Five, um, our stewardship and the, and uh, you know, I think a, a SD15 is fine on GHG and things like that. If we want to put more emphasis on it, I'm okay with that. But I think the way it's written is fine. Um, Number four, when we talk about getting outside of our mission of electricity and water, um, having lived and experienced that when we had severe budget uh, challenges years ago, and we, we put the educational programs and a few other things on the block, and uh, then we found out from the community how important those were, I'd kind of le like to not consider moving those out, even though they're not in our defined mission. Um, the, the educational programs for the kids at the schools and everything else, I learned a whole lot when we we thought we were going to axe those. Um, and I think they're very important. And I think they're, they're although not direct, they're indirect. And I think it's important that we educate the kids and everything about alternative energy and solar programs and things such as that. So I, I'm okay with leaving those in. Um, number three, about uh, selling or preserving generation assets. I, I don't want to sell or, or get rid of our, because all of our generation is green. And uh, and I, I want to keep it, uh, you know, even though if it doesn't make economic sense for us, I, I have, I, I'm challenged how somebody else can can provide uh, the electricity with the same resource and make it financially feasible. So if they can do it, I think we can do it because I think we're the best at doing it. And so I, I personally would not want to divest anything unless it was something like, you know, the recent things we've divested in that made no economic sense about retooling the wind farm and things such as that. Um, so uh, that's number three. Um, as far as number two, delivering drinking, uh, you know, alternative things like uh, I'm OK with exploring uh, alternative things, but not until we know the economic impacts of, of, of that, like when we go to broadband Internet and things such as that, if we're going to be a service provider, uh, that's a, a huge question. And I would not want to spend a lot of time and resources on that right now because of everything else is on our plate. And lastly, about number one, about expanding uh, or narrow our community, uh, you know, our reach. Um, regional water, I think, is, is going to be something that we're going to have to discuss or consider in the future. I know that, you know, we, we provided water to Benita and we got sued, but uh, it, it, it helps, you know, these bedroom communities aren't, they don't have a glacial source of water. They have a groundwater source and, and rainwater source. And if they're not allowed to use storage from the Corps of Engineers reservoirs, um, I think both north and south are going to be looking to us for water and i think we need to to think about that um as far as uh, we've already discussed and we had it at one time a proposal and talking about selling the upriver to uh, lane electric uh, we had that discussion and then when we immediately did that and then residents up there found out that lane electric rates were higher than ours we got an earful and so, uh, but I think it makes more sense to know that, you know, we have 2000 customers up there, but it's 50% of our service area and, and the cost of providing service. I mean, the numbers are the numbers. And so if, if it made economic sense and the residents wanted it, uh, I would certainly look about contracting and, and selling the upriver service territory if it, if it made sense for all concerns. So that's my, those are my responses to one through six. I'll, Look forward to hearing to others. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. I, these these questions are actually. I just want to make sure that people are clear, especially if there's anybody listening in from the Mackenzie Valley, that these questions were not posed as a as a predisposition or or a desire. Um, the way that management historically has viewed the answer to that question is it's not a a uh, preordained choice that if at some point the opportunity came along and it was let's say good for lane electric good for eweb and good for the customers that we would be willing to explore it um, it is not um, sort of by policy or by strategy eliminated from concern it's also not something where i'm hearing from the commissioners oh let's put it on the block um, let's put it up for sale so we are viewing it more as that they are part of our territory. We continue to support, uh, serve and support that community um, the best way that we can, um, you know, aligning with all the other values and the strategies. So it's it's not sort of separated out um, in any particular way. And the same thing with the generation. Um, I would ask you, Commissioner Brown, if 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 you could choose between 
and this is this is hypothetical. This is not these are not real numbers, but if you could choose between a 15% rate decrease and being in the generation business on our own, would you how would you make that choice? I would keep the generation because I think it, we, we, I don't want to be at the mercy of one entity like if Canada cuts off our water treaty on the Columbia or if we have if they take out the Snake River dams and things like that. We're 100 percent dependent upon somebody else to provide our service. We have no fallback. And, uh, you know, and you know, the fact that where we are rate in competitiveness and everything else and the fact that we know that the easiest way to the most cost effective way to generate new resources to conservation, I think we're going to be able to uh, to address that. I'd like to keep the generation as much as we can. I, you know, I know that it may not be cost effective, but it's cost effective for somebody someplace. And uh, I have I'm, I'm challenged to say that we could buy it cheaper than we could produce it, because how can somebody else produce it cheaper than we can? Uh, what are we not doing right? And some, so some of that, yeah, some of that is scale. Uh, I would answer that through, through scale. But but what you've described to me, Commissioner, if I think I would and correct me if I'm wrong, I would classify that as a risk mitigation approach to generation, not not just so much the attributes of what's being generated, but you're willing to pay extra uh, for the fact that that we're diversifying the risk uh, from our, you know, as part of our mix. So it's a mix of what we own versus what we procure. Um, is that kind of a, a fair assessment? That would be my that would be my particular position because I think that uh, to be totally reliant and dependent upon outside sources when historically for the last hundred years we've had you know thirty five percent generation or whatever uh, it's worked in the past and I think it's only and there I I can't envision how they're going to create more generation to meet this demand as as we increase the demand and we get off of carbon. Um, and the electricity demands increase, uh, the, the, the availability and the resources, I think, are going to be very challenging to, to meet the demand. And so I, I would not want that just for a short term rate relief to give up our generation capacity. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Matt or John, one of you want go ahead, John. Borowski. OK. Thank you. Um, so uh, number one, uh, I like the idea of leaving it the way it is. Give, that gives us. Uh, I think that gives us the uh, opportunistic changes, like you said, when we see things coming up. Um, is drinking water and electricity enough? Yes, for me, that is yes. When we start talking broadband and technology, Investing a lot of resources in technology today that may be obsolete in five years, you know, we may be having satellite internet from from Elon Musk in five years. So that gives me pause. Uh, so I'm fine with water and electricity. Um, I'm with John Brown as far as the generation. Uh, and and for me, it's it. it it's not just the risk that we're trying to avoid. It's also, um, you know, as more and more of the fossil fuel plants come offline, finding finding carbon free energy, I think is going to get more and more uh, at a premium. Uh, I think, you know, we're looking right now, yeah, power prices are low because there's a lot of natural gas out there. But if if natural gas starts going away, like the way that coal's going away, then Carbon free is going to be at a premium, I, I hope, and I hope having having a carbon free in our portfolio is something that's important to me. Um, number four, the give backs. I'm I'm also as long as we're able to do that, I, I'm in favor of that. Um, number five, I'm on. Yes, I do have one question about SD 15 and I know there's a slide a little bit later. I don't know if we'll we're going to get into that, but I do have a question about that at some point when we get to that. Um, and then. The prioritizations, um, obviously this the safety one, I think everybody's on board with that, but I also feel that that if we set prioritizations as this board, I don't feel comfortable with that because you you say boards are going to change in in future years. Well, yes, 
boards change and so do uh, circumstances in the community change. And so for us to prioritize those now, and who knows when we're going to come back and visit this. In three years, there may be a different board, but we may not have the opportunity to uh, go through and dig through this as that board. And so the priorities were set by us, and, and I don't feel comfortable with that. I think it's a flowing material, and it it may be tough for, for staff to deal with, but that's what a an elected board is here to do is give that direction and if there needs to be a change um, i think that's appropriate i mean if you had asked the board 10 years ago is should carbon be one of our strategic goals they would have probably not put it in there and i don't want to put on a board 10 years from now what i think the the strategic goals should be so that's kind of where i'm at thanks Thanks, Commissioner Borowski. Um, you know, they, they, I, I think that um, management is, is, and staff are in favor of, of the roster of values also. Um, you know, one of the examples is that when you have values um, such as we have where they're, they're not weighted, you know, I'll use the Lieberg, um, Canal as an example, there there are there are going to be tensions between the social, the environmental, the financial, and and if we were to prioritize, and I'll just use an example, if we if we put in our our mission statement that we were going to contribute to the vitality of the community by providing affordable and therefore elevated the affordable value out of the values and into the the statement, then cost would start to rule. Um, over some of those those other values, it wouldn't be as balanced. And so, while it's a little bit more challenging because it becomes more case to case, um, it's probably appropriate uh, given the governance structure that you mentioned and the fact that we have such a variety of different decisions to make, um, where affordability might not be as important in one decision or another. So, um, I, I think we have felt like a more balanced approach works for us. Um, e even though it has its challenges, recognizing that the the one thing I was going to point out about the 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 telecom because telecom was mentioned, there are a number of different ways to enter the telecom uh, arena. Not all of those are as a service provider. Um, you have you have different levels. You you could be more of a a backbone provider. You could be a transport provider. Um, or you could actually supply internet services. There's so there's there's different ways to enter that arena. Um, in general, what I'm hearing is we have a lot to focus on now. And if if we were to to get away from that, maybe this isn't the right time to get away from that focus. But um, I just wanted to make sure that people were clear that it wasn't put in there as a any you know any sort of preconceived notion but there are different ways that you can get into that arena if that was if if, if that's i didn't want people to be mis misinterpret what the intent of that question was and then just one last thing are we going to talk to go to the other slides and uh should i hold off on my question about sd 15. um i I think you can go ahead and I don't know how much time you have left. <laughs> go ahead and ask, I think you can ask your question now. OK, can you drop down a few slides so that it comes up? Because there's just one word that I have a question about. If you could pull up it, it's. It was in the reference slides. Yeah. Slide 14. Yeah, slide 14. So on this one, on, on number two, it says participate in local, state and regional efforts to encourage develop and enact measures to mitigate carbon emissions in the energy sector that contribute to climate change. So when we say the energy sector and that we are going to be encouraging and developing and enacting measures to mitigate, that could be construed as to say that we're, you know, if if the city of Eugene says we'd like to we'd like to ban natural gas, how does how would that play in? Um, if we say participate in regional efforts to encourage, develop, and enact measures to mitigate carbon in the energy sector. Yeah, the, I think that particular 
I, I don't I don't actually know if I was around in the original drafting of, of SD15, but I know when we when we looked at one of the revisions a few years ago, it was just to acknowledge that there's a lot of overlap um, that occurs uh, depending on how broadly you want to cast your net between different forms of energy. Um, you know, one example of that, uh, Commissioner, is um, we've um, we advocated for the the hydrogen study bill, um, and you know that's that's an example of one where if we were just limited to electricity, um, that's a little bit bit you know outside of the window. It could have said electricity. I think we chose energy because there is a lot of crossover. The to a certain extent, decisions made by um, by others, we we weigh very carefully what our position is going to be on some of those. So this this is not to necessarily recognize that um, it's it's an all or nothing. We we look very closely at the impacts to got kind of a triple bottom line: the social, what's the impact on electricity. So it was really meant um, to uh, recognize that there's a lot of of um, synergies between different different parts of the energy sector. That that was the intent. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Matt. Thanks, Mindy. Um, great questions and commentary so far. It is quite a privilege to work with such a group of thoughtful people. Um, so uh, I'll try and go through my comments here quickly, and then I have one question at the end. Um, I think, Frank, the update la updated language here is um, really solid and reflects our conversations so far. So I appreciate the way that you've incorporated uh, what you've heard from, from the board. Um, a strike through version, if that's possible, would help me compare more easily uh, in, next time, whether it's this or, you know, some other document that we're looking at. I don't know how possible that is. It's possible that uh, that's just not easy to do given the level of changes, but if it is, that would be great. Um, going into specific questions, I don't feel like we need to refine our geographic or community scope. Uh, like Sonia, I believe we should leave some room for providing internet as a service possibly. Um, I wouldn't want to close that door. It feels like there's a growing community demand and it's something that EWIB could potentially do very cost effectively. So I would like to leave the door open to that. I don't have really strong feelings about whether or not EWIB owns generation. However, I do care very much about the mix of power that we purchase. And like John Brown, I care a lot about retaining some measure of generation that is locally controlled and locally generated. I think that's really important. In terms of um, prioritizing specific values, I agree with Sonia that safety, for me anyway, makes the top of the list. I think at this point in time, many of these values are really mutually reinforcing rather than competing. Um, well, Eugene doesn't have a great influence on global greenhouse gas emissions. I recognize that. If we don't collectively eliminate greenhouse gas emissions, it will become extremely difficult and maybe impossible to address affordability and reliability values. That said, my understanding is that when it comes to electricity supply, if we plan carefully, there isn't necessarily a huge trade-off between low carbon and affordable and reliable and safe. Um, I guess it's all a long way of saying, I think leaving them mixed and balanced is the right way to go. Um, and uh, safety certainly tops the list for me. Um, I think it's important uh, that we find an appropriate location or location for numerical strategic goal. I don't think that belongs in this strategic plan, but I think it is important for this board to provide some measurable um, goals that we uh, toward which the, the organization should steer. I think we need clear and measurable goals around equity, affordability, and the environmental attributes of our services. Uh, specifically, when we think about Lieberg, for example, we know that customers will have questions about our commitments to low carbon electricity and locally controlled electricity generation. And to the extent that we have made 
clear policy commitments to strategic goals, I think it um, will help our our customers understand um, where we're trying to go. And lastly, my question for you, Frank, um, I'm curious when, where, and how this board will wrestle with strategic goals. Because of the big decisions that are before this board in the next few years, at a minimum, minimum, I would like to see us revise and update the strategic direction policy 15 within the next six months. That's all I have. Thank you. So thanks, um, Commissioner. Uh, so so when, so I'll, I'll address a couple of your comments and then answer your question. Um, I, I did actually do a, a side by side track changes. It, it was so, so bad that <laughs> it was basically hard to follow. Um, I, I thought I really that might be the case. You know, what happened is we rearranged sections, we pulled things, it, it basically became meaningless. So um, we, we have used, uh, as you know, track changes on a lot of different documents where there's um, kind of simple additions or revisions. So that that's, I, I think, you know, part of that one. Uh, one of the things that I was going to, and, and I think it's a, it's a potential to include in the plan, uh, is a reference somewhere that, um, the the execution of the strategic plan will be consistent and incorporated in the annual goal setting process. Um, now that's that's actually already covered in another document. It's it's so it's it's actually in one of the board policies that the general manager will bring forth um, or the board will bring. Actually, I think I think it's stated that the board will bring forth to the general manager um, the expectations. Um, for the year and the annual goal setting. It's, it's kind of a back and forth and I'm not sure wh where it starts actually, um, but um, it is, and, and some of that refer to the the strategic goals of the organization. So, so the link is on the other end, but I don't see where it would be difficult to somehow incorporate a reference that um, the, the execution of the strategic plan will be reiterated and, and captured and discussed and approved as part of the annual goal setting process. I think that could that could that reference could be made. Um, so I think that probably even addresses your question about how do you how do you get to that? Um, you you have the strategy, and then um, you know basically every January the uh, the goals associated with the execution of that strategy are are deliberated, discussed, negotiated. Um, and then eventually approved. So, um, so, so I, um, I'll double check. I see if, if there's a if there's a good place to provide the link the other direction in the plan. I'll try to incorporate it uh, before uh, we bring it back. Great, thanks. And then in terms of updating the strategic direction policies, I know there's quite a few of those. I don't know how often or what the process is for updating those, but I'd be curious your thoughts about that. Yeah, use the the board policies. There's there are a few of them that get get updated when there's some sort of other change. There's a lot of sort of linkages there. Um, however, if um, any particular board member wanted to have a discussion reviewing a particular board policy, um, that would typically just go through the the normal um, kind of items from board members where it could be, um, you know, we'd like to allocate some future agenda time to review and, and revise and discuss, you know, board policy SD15 uh, climate change policy. So that that could be um, just approached in that way um, as with any other policy as well. So any any of the board policies in particular, those those are really policies of the board. So um, you know, if, if any member wants to now, if no other board members are interested in it and you don't get any hand hand raises, then it it moves on um, or it remains intact. Great, thank you. So I think I'll anticipate that at one of these upcoming board meetings that uh, Commissioner McRae will be um, looking for hand raises to review SD 15. Likely, <laughs> thanks, Frank. 
All right, so I'm the last one, and I guess one of the benefits of going last is that everybody's already said really great stuff and a lot of what I would say, and then kind of provide a little fodder for thought for me. So I will be totally honest with you, Frank. I think my brain works really differently than yours, and I get a little confused with the strategic, the strategic plan stuff. And I think that I get confused because like we keep seeing iterations of it and I know that you're tweaking it and we're talking about it. And maybe like Matt's thing about seeing a strike through copy is I'd start to get confused about where we've shifted or what we've talked about. Um, and, and I also think Matt's suggestion about having some measurable goals. I don't know where that belongs, but for me that would be helpful too because I mean, this is all really big, obviously long term stuff. It's strategic, but I I guess I start to get a little confused about where we carry out like there's many paths of carrying out many of those things. And um, we talk about. Um, like we talk about things like wanting more energy efficiency, but um, I'm curious, like how are we specifically targeting those things and how do we know like when we're looking at the strategic plan how do we know that we're meeting specific goals i know that you have a working document and, and you know that and maybe the other commissioners do too and i'm totally off base but i think sometimes it would be nicer not necessarily to get more in the weeds but maybe a little more streamlined about what is the target that we are trying to get and what will we be considered a success I don't know. I, I don't know so, if others feel that way. <laughs> so it's it's a it's a great question and comment, um, President Schlossberg. So I'll I'll preface it in a couple of ways. So first of all, there's a recognition, at least in our process, that not everything we do is strategic. Um, when when we talk about achieving certain target levels of energy efficiency, for example. That to me is covered under the direction that the board has provided as to how we're going to operate. So we we already have targets. Those targets have been established through past integrated resource plans, et cetera. We, we have a whole roster of metrics uh, that we um, we monitored and I, I would describe it as um, when you look at what is typically the last few years been our our first goal. Uh, on the annual goals, it's operate the utility the way you've already told us to operate. <laughs> so, so that's that is a little bit. And we, um, one of the changes that we made a few years ago, we went through the strategic planning process, was a recognition that not everything we do is strategic, and not everybody has a strategic role. Um, what we've tried to capture in the strategy is um, what we need to do and why we need to do it. Um, how we do it falls back on the annual goal setting. Those are those are the, actually the milestones. So when I think about a strategy, it's really thinking about, OK, here's what we need to do in the, to set up the utility. Here's what we need to do in the next few years. Here's why we need to do it. And then on an annual basis, we to jointly develop the milestones and the measurements on the strategic elements, the strategic pieces. Uh, which is probably going to be a few items. It's not going to be a roster of 20 things. Those 20 things come from the precursor, the prerequisite that says in order to do this strategic stuff, you still have to operate the utility we've, the way we've told you to do it. Um, you've, you've told us to do it in a number of ways. Some of it is through board policy. Some of it is through past resolutions. I, I think the last time we looked, we had over 40 active resolutions um, that we were adhering to from the board. And, and I, I obviously don't think that you passed all those. Uh, some of those have been developed through the years. So um, I think two, two answers to your question. Not everything is strategic. A lot of it's captured through operational metrics. And then when I think about a strategy, it's really the what and the why touches a little bit on the how, but the how generally comes in the sort of the policies that get developed, like SD15 as an example, the financial policies, some of the others, and then the annual goal setting. I don't know if that helped or confused you. But yeah. <laughs> that's kind of how I view it. Um, 
then on to the the questions that you asked. Um, so I feel very similar. I mean, it seems like everybody has very similar answers, but should we um, define, expand or narrow our community reach? I guess I'm agnostic about that one. I guess it would it would depend, but I'm not interested in um, like actively exploring that right now. Um, in terms of the question about broadband, I actually think that Internet should be a public utility. I don't know that we're the utility to provide it, but if that opportunity came around or there was some kind of um, partnership among different community um, stakeholders and we had an opportunity to participate in that, I would say we should definitely pursue it. Um, in terms of selling or preserving our generation assets. I feel really similarly to John Brown about that. Um, I know it kind of opens up a whole lot of questions, especially as we're looking at Lieberg, but something that our community really values, I think is uh, local control. And I also agree about um, the need to make sure that we have carbon free resources or carbon free um, generation. Um, in terms of rate pressures and community services, I think one of the things that makes us special is that we have social and community services, and I would um, fight really hard to make sure that we maintain those. Otherwise, we're, we're just a company. Um, I think that about uh, board policy SD15, I mean, I, what I've heard from my fellow commissioners is that everybody thinks that that is a, a high priority. So uh, I'm not sure what I think about the current wording of it, but if there's any way that would even strengthen it more, I would support looking at, at that. And then for the last one about the values, I mean, I agreed with what other people said, like obviously safe, but I think all of those other ones, it's kind of like those um, magnetic poetry on the refrigerator or something like <laughs> you can move them around and it might say something different but i think that they're all they're all pretty interchangeable thank you president schlossberg the um so i know everybody mentioned safety and and sa safety is incredibly important to to all of us i i will point out that even within the the safety world um there's a lot of discussion around risk mitigation um, you you don't blindly go into even a safety discussion without looking at at both the the likelihood and the magnitude of the risk that you're facing. And so it's um, because if you did, then then you would probably never leave the house um, and um, you'd spend a lot of money having um, uh, Grubhub. You know, you spend a lot of money in other other areas. So um, the, these do all work together. Um, there there are challenges and trade offs. Um, even within some of the things that I think people have recognized um, um, earlier. And, and I think there will be trade-offs as we reassemble a, a power portfolio. Um, but I don't think that you go into that uh, creating a priority of, of one over the other. Um, so I think we we agree and support with with the balance uh, between those um, those different different values. Um, as, um, so. So yeah, I think I think you'll find you'll find support there. Um, the the way I I will say that um, the way that our mission is is written now um, is that um, it says uh, drinking water and electric electric delivery of drinking water and electricity. It does not explicitly say anything else. So um, that is not something that we would be inclined to pursue. Uh, at this point, um, the generation was a, is an interesting one. I, I appreciate everybody's comments. Um, I would describe that as sort of we we are in, in that side of well, I guess in both sides we're vertically integrated. We we work on everything from the source through the delivery. Um, there are a lot of utilities um, that are not vertically integrated. They they focus on delivery. Um, and not on generation. Um, we we are a little bit different. Part of that's been part of our history. 
what I'm hearing is that the board is interested in continuing to be vertically integrated. Um, I'm not sure that I would necessarily agree with the, the fact that you cannot uh, buy carbon free resources, but I do understand the issue of local control um, and the localness and the risk mitigation piece. So um, um, even at a cost, which I, I think I also heard. So we are presently vertically integrated. It sounds like the board, um, based on how the strategy is written and sort of a lot of things um, in the priorities is is interested in continuing that as one of the sort of cornerstones as we go forward. So um, that was helpful for me to understand and I think helpful, hopefully for you to kind of coalesce around too. So uh, Commissioner McRae. Yeah, I just have a quick question about that. Is it possible to retain some local control of local generation without owning it? Um, is that something that we can purchase somehow? I, I guess from my perspective, it's not so important that eWeb owns it. It's the local control of something, of an asset that's uh, close enough that it's useful in a time of, of disruption otherwise. Anyway, I just want to put that out there. Yeah, that it, I'll, I'll answer directly. Yes, that is possible. You know, there, there there's, there's actually a very good example at Seneca. Um, so, I mean, we, you know, which has been in, in it was a 15 year uh, power purchase agreement. Um, we we could also, even if, if I'll, I'll just say there's a lot of options. I won't get into too many what ifs, but even if you sold an asset um, to another independent power producer or another larger utility, um, really more geared toward that, you could make arrangements for the use of it during emergencies, for example, um, you could place special operating requirements if there was concern about um, the Mackenzie River, for example, in, in one case or another, but um, it is possible. Um, that's not what I'm hearing, though, just to be clear. I'm, I'm hearing from the board that um, even at a premium, the uh, diversification of resource staying vertically integrated is the preference. Um, now, an integrated resource planner is something um, might change your opinion, but you are not predisposed to either sell it off or buy more. Um, that's going to be determined by uh, the eventual need of, of the community. That, that's the way I'm reading that. And I think that's the way it's written. Yes, President Schlossberg. So I just want to comment about that. Um, I mean, so you just presented another option, which I mean, I'm not an expert, so I don't know what all the options are. So I guess I wouldn't want to say like throw out other options because at least from me, what you heard me say is that I value a locally owned carbon free uh, asset. I mean, I think that's my preference, but I would hate for that to be something that like ends up driving us when per personally, I don't know what the other things are. <laughs> so if there was like another great option, I would want to hear that. Great. Right. The the way that the plan is written is that it doesn't preclude um, or suppose that we will be in or out of the generation business. It it doesn't. It, I think it's in in some ways a lot like one of the earlier discussions around the the adding of different services or the selling. I'll say the selling of the McKenzie territory. Um, if if we go through the integrated resource planning process and it drives us toward a certain set of resources and I'll just hypothetically say none of our present resources that we own uh, fill uh, an imminent need in that, that could open up some possibilities, but it's within the context of the integrated resource plan. What I'm what I what I'm not hearing is I'm not I'm not hearing the board say, oh, we absolutely want to sell them off and get rid of it and cut our you know go back and focus on delivery i'm not hearing that and i'm also not hearing i want to do everything absolutely possible to keep them independent of any opportunity so it, it will be driven by some other part of a decision it's it's i'm not hearing an absolute one way or the other which is way the which is the way it's written presently But it was a good question, I think, just just because of that. So. Okay. 
anybody else? Any last questions for Frank? I guess yeah. I would uh, very quickly ask the timeline for, so if we're adopting this uh, at the next meeting, the timeline for revisiting it, what has that typically been? So, um, great question, um, Commissioner McRae. Typically, what we like to do is, is take a snapshot um, and what makes the most sense from a sort of revisiting standpoint is probably in the May kind of time frame. Um, that sometimes April or May, and the reason for that is that we're getting ready to come back to the board with capital plans and investment plans, usually in July, and it gives us a chance to uh, do an assessment of the plan um, kind of before we get into that sort of heavy budgetary and capital planning process. So sometime in the late, I'll just classify as a late spring, and and, and we, we want to do that at least on an annual basis, or if there's some sort of distinguishing event in between that time, but at least annually late spring, and then if dictated by some sort of uh, substantial situational change. Did that answer your question? Yeah, great, thank you. Well, Pre President Schlossberg, this, this was helpful for me um, I will um, bring back to the board um, if there's, and, and this will be, track changes will be on this time between what you saw today and, and what comes back, um, hopefully for your approval uh, in October. Um, I've got a few good suggestions on some, some modifications and, and clarifications. Um, and I will uh, work to incorporate that uh, before that meeting. And I, I really do appreciate the comments and the feedback. Um, it was it was useful. I, I hope it was useful for you. Yes, thank you. Okay, so that takes us to our board wrap up. Anybody have anything to wrap up? Yes, John Borofsky. A um, couple of things. One, first, Frank, uh, I don't know about how much fun you're going to you have with rate design, but you alluded to that earlier, and I'm just intrigued by how much fun that's going to be. Um, it, it, I hope it, it, it it's as fun as you alluded to be. Um, but the other thing I just wanted to mention, <clears throat> so I drove back from Bend yesterday and I drove the Mackenzie. It was a beautiful day. The mountains were out. It was it was fabulous. But I also had the opportunity to stop at the Fin, fin Rock Reach just because it was there. Um, and we had uh, a rain event over the weekend. And so I just kind of wanted to take a look at it. Um, it was very interesting that I, I walked it. I walked two tributaries that were coming into it. It was Monday, so the turbidity was it, the 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 tributaries were fairly clean, but you could see where they went into the reach, even if they were dirty, there was going to be excessive filtration before it hit the main channel. It was really uh, encouraging to see. I mean, you walk it along and you just see all these logs that are just piled on to each other and you think, oh, what a mess. But when you get down in there and kind of start walking the logs and seeing underneath, it was very encouraging. So I just wanted to bring that up that to, to actually see it, to walk on the logs, to watch the the water, you know, not in the in the middle of the drought, to actually see water flowing through there was very encouraging. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, President Schlossberg, I, I, I know that um, we are scheduling or have have already scheduled a tour for commissioners um, to the Fin Rock Reach. I don't remember the exact um, date off the top of my head, but um, it, it we do have some scheduled sort of revisiting the Mackenzie Valley. We did it um, last year. We did it last spring, and so uh, we do have another one scheduled to see some of the work that Commissioner Borofsky. Oh, uh, Ann Codd just said it's October 22nd. So um, thank you, Ann. Great. 
All right. Anybody else have any other wrap up? Nope. Well, thank you everyone for this extra meeting. I know this is a busy month for us with our City of Eugene joint meeting next Monday, but um, I always really appreciate the opportunity to separate this kind of stuff out from a regular meeting because it's just, I think, easier for me personally, selfishly, <laughs> to focus, but um, I, I'm really grateful that we're doing more of these work sessions. So it is seven o'clock and this meeting is adjourned and we are all free to enjoy the rest of our evenings. Good night. Thanks, Mindy. Good night. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Hey guys, thank you.